Yeah, it's a huge pleasure to be um, introducing Melissa, Melissa Mendez and also Caroline Parker. Um, Melissa is going to give the paper and Caroline is going to chair the very um, graciously going to chair the, the session for us. Um, without further ado, then I'll hand over to Caroline, um, who will take you from here. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks a lot, Jack. Um, and hi, everyone. It's really nice to see so many names. I'm sure we're going to have a really good session. Um, Alyssa is going to be talking today for about 40 minutes, and um, then I hope we have a lively discussion with all of you. Um, as usual, after the session, it's just a you can just raise your hand. Um, we can take questions that way. If you're really prompted with a question halfway through the presentation, feel free to put it in the chat. You can also do that anonymously, and I can get around to it at the end. But um, equally, just pitching in at the end with your face and voice is also wonderful. Um, so it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Melissa Mendez, a lecturer in criminology in the School of Social Sciences at Cardiff University, um, who previously taught criminology at Swansea. Um, Melissa is originally from Trinidad and Tobago, and she completed her PhD at Cardiff University in 2019. Um, her doctoral thesis explored the subjective lived experiences of detained young male offenders in Trinidad and Tobago in the context of social justice, state legitimacy, and procedural justice. Um, in addition to her PhD, wow, 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 uh, Melissa holds an LLB from the University of the West Indies, um, a legal education certificate from the Hugh Whitting Law School, an LLM from UCL, and an MSc in social science research methods from Cardiff. So she's been a real busy bee. Um, she's an attorney at law qualified to practice law in the West Indies since 2006, and her research interests center on legitimacy, race and ethnicity, decolonization, stigma, masculinity, social justice and youth justice. Um, so I'm really excited to uh, hear her presentation today. I'm not quite sure if she's doing a share screen and a PowerPoint yet, but I will hand over to her to take it from here and we'll stop in about 40 minutes. Thank you, Caroline, and thank you, Jack. Yeah, I am just going to share my screen now. Um, and it will be great if you can let me know if you can see when I start the slideshow, we get it right. Can you see my notes or the actual slides? We can see your notes, Melissa. Okay, let me swap. And that should have done it then. Perfect. Brilliant. Right. So I actually haven't given a talk for, I don't know, maybe over a year other than lecturing. So I actually feel a bit nervous, which is very weird for me. Um, but yeah, I'm here today and I'm going to, going to be talking about assessing uh, the decivilizing or civilizing processes in, in the state of, of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, right, there we go. So the topic that I'm presenting today, it's moved on just a bit, not too much uh, from where I'd intended um, when, when I started. So um, like I said, not, not too much. I'm still focusing on assessing the legitimacy of the young post-colonial nation state of Trinidad and Tobago. And I am still doing this against the backdrop of the rise of a radical Islamist group, the Jamaat al-Muslimin, um, which attempted a coup, coup d'etat in, in 1990. I'm also still going to be applying Weber and, and Elias and their concepts of legitimacy and civilizing processes, um, particularly in, in light of the increase in the number of, um, and the embeddedness of gangs in Trinidad and Tobago since that 1990 attempted coup. What I'm also going to do that sort of wasn't in my abstract is to try to apply some more indigenously sensitive analysis. And so taking a bit of a post-colonial look uh, lens to, to look at um, what's happened post-1990, given the region's post-colonial status. So what I'm going to try to do, um, and you can sort of give me your thoughts on it uh, when we come to, to the end of it, is to see if moving away from, from Weber, moving away from Elias, offers a more useful theoretical analysis. So that has been my theoretical journey, not just with this paper, but also with my PhD research and sort of with all of my research and analysis over the course of the last five, six years or so. Um, 
and and I would sort of like to take you um, somewhat along that journey with me today. Speaking about journey, just a brief um, uh, detour. The picture that you can see in this slide, this is a community, um, it's a village where I grew up in, in Trinidad, and actually um, it's really close to where my grandmother lived. So this is actually a journey that I have made many times in my life, sort of from my house going, going to, to my grandmother's house as a child. Okay, so we're going to start off with a little bit of background um, about Trinidad and Tobago for those of you who may not know too much about it. So Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, it's the southernmost um, Caribbean uh, uh, island nation located about seven miles um, just northeast of Venezuela. It's got a population now of approximately 1.4 million people, um, so quite small, but it is a multi racial, multi-ethnic, uh, multi-religious uh, country. Um, Trinidad and Tobago um, was um, colonized by the British, by the Spanish, um, achieved independence from, from the British uh, in 1962, has remained a member of the Commonwealth in 1976, adopted a Republican constitution, which replaced the queen or the king as, as head of state um, and now has a president. Economically, Trinidad and Tobago has one of the highest um, gross national incomes per capita um, in Latin America and the Caribbean. So oil was discovered off the coast of Trinidad and Tobago in the 19th century, sort of in the 20th century, it began to be to be exploited. Um, and that's really that exploitation of crude oil is what um, allowed Trinidad and Tobago to become one of the wealthier uh, Caribbean nations. Since 2017, uh, post 2017, the economy has contracted somewhat. Um, and has experienced increased financial challenges. Um, it is expected, and that's also um, been exacerbated by the global pandemic. It's expected um, that growth will increase again, um, sort of once uh, international and local um, economies uh, begin to reopen. Um, what else do I want to say? Uh, Trinidad and Tobago's political, economic, um, and its social structures, composition of, of the society today, they're all founded on uh, its Caribbean history of colonization, slavery, and, and indentureship. Um, I would go into, this is really quite a whistle-top uh, tour, um, but yeah, I would go into it in a little bit more detail if I could. Um, but if you do want to know a little bit more about it, it will be in the paper that I'm working on once it is eventually published. So, um, as is true for um, areas surrounding many capital cities all across the world, uh, poverty is entrenched within uh, the communities surrounding uh, Port of Spain, which is Trinidad's uh, capital. And this isn't true for all communities surrounding the capital city. So there are some communities, St. Anne's, Cascade, for example, um, that are settled by uh, upper middle class communities. They, you know, where they, they experience limited crime, but poverty and crime is quite prevalent and widespread in East Port of Spain, in communities like Sea Lots, Beetham Gardens, and Laventil. And so Professor, Professor Selwyn Ryan, whom I quote on, on this slide, he is a criminologist in, in Trinidad. And he explains that because of the circumstances of its settlement, Laventil in Trinidad in East Port of Spain, it's always been a really depressed community. So Laventil was originally um, populated by people seeking refuge from plantation life. So there were escaped slaves, people who abandoned the plantations after emancipation, um, more skilled artisans performing services, you know, within Port of Spain who sought to live on the outskirts of Port of Spain, and a very small number of, of Black slave owners. It was also, Laventil, uh, a haven for many people who moved to Trinidad from the smaller islands who were trying to um, search for employment and for a better way of life. Very quickly, however, living conditions in and around that community in, in, in Port of Spain deteriorated. 
and more and wealthier city city dwellers um, left uh, communities east of Port of Spain um, for for um, other communities. So what we saw was that poor rural migrants, Caribbean immigrants settled within the hills of Laventil and within wider areas within East Port of Spain, where land was in abundance and the ownership of that land was, was quite unclear. So that really provided the opportunity for very low rent, for squatting within these communities. There were few amenities available even then, and that's remained um, into today's, um, into contemporary times. Um, and just the, the makeup of the community, the hills, you can't really see it from that picture, but you can sort of see it. The hills made it quite difficult for the provision of roads, water and electricity. And so that over time, Laventil really became a community populated by a poor black underclass. And that's how Salwyn Ryan um, defined them in, in one of his studies that you, you can see on, on the references slide at the end. He said that it's um, deficient in social and, and financial capital. And this really is how he described this community. And it will become clear why I'm talking about it in a minute. So he said, while there are areas in Laventil that are more depressed than others, our study indicates that its area and the diaspora within East Port of Spain peopled mainly by dysfunctional one parent families, houses that are poorly appointed and which are poorly provisioned with basic utilities and toilet facilities. In terms of human capital, the community lacks community pride and cohesion, is possessed of a considerable number of delinquent and illiterate youth with learning disabilities, incomplete schooling, home environments that are characterized by violence, spousal abuse, widespread use of psychotropic drugs, high proportion of ex-prison inmates, high mortality rates. So really, really challenging issues that exist within these communities sort of around the capital city of Port of Spain, mostly within, within East Port of Spain. Right. So within East Port of Spain, in the city of Laventil and other communities, as I said, once again, once populated by escaped, freed slaves, migrants to neighboring islands, quite a poor, deprived, um, deprived communities, originally quite deprived communities and steadily over time, over the course of a hundred years or so, um, amenities and life really um, steadily worsened in, in, in its social and its environmental conditions within, within these communities. The, these really were depressed communities that felt, and, and in many ways had been long abandoned um, by successive, um, you know, colonial masters and then successive governments within, within Trinidad and Tobago. So conditions really worsened over time. And there were negative sentiments that existed for a number of years within, within these communities. And conditions seriously worsened um, and, and, and a sense of, of anger sort of and hopelessness sort of really embedded um, within, within the 1980s. Because in the 1980s, the country experienced a really severe economic crisis. And this crisis came after sort of a period of great um, prosperity, the oil boom years of, of, of the late um, 70s. Um, and then there was this considerable shrinking within, within the economy. And over the course of sort of the, the early 80s years, the, the government um, set up, um, decided that, that it was uh, in need of a time of austerity. So oil revenues had continued to decline in the time, unemployment increased up to 20%, poverty, unemployment, economic and social instability, all of this sort of increased in the country sort of broadly and this was felt very, very much in more deprived communities like those like Laventil and Silos within, within East Port of Spain. And the government at the time in, in the 80s, the NER, the National Alliance for Reconstruction, they introduced austerity measures. So social welfare programs that had once um, existed 
um, were suspended, public sector salaries were reduced by 10%, um, VAT was, was, uh, was introduced by, by the uh, NER government in the 80s. And so this was really what we were seeing mostly in, in the 80s. This was the political economic backdrop to the rise of the Jamaat al-Muslimin and the attempted coup in, in 1990. So the jam was started as Jamaat al um sort of started in the in the late 1990s, early uh, 80s, um, by Imam uh, Yasin Abu Bakr. He was formerly called Lennox Phillips. He was uh, a police officer at one point in time. Um, came to uh, religion and decided to to start this this group. Um, and he intended for this group to, to advocate on behalf of Afro-Trinidadians. So originally, that's what the Jamaat al-Muslimin was meant to, to be. So the Jamaat and Abu Bakr at the time had been greatly influenced by the Black Power movement of the 60s and 70s. That's sort of where it began and how it grew. And in the context of, of austerity conditions, unemployment, um, dispossessed um, young poor, um, the, the Jamaat began reaching out to, to some of these people, particularly those who were living in and around the city of, of, um, of, of Port of Spain. And, and, and at this crucial time, um, the Jamaat started providing services for these people. So they pro provided medication and food and clothing and shelter to people who at the time really, really needed it. And so Abu Bakr says, and it's cited in, in Simmons, I say, and Simmons was the Commission of Inquiry into the attempted coup. And Bakr is quoted as saying, we are in daily contact with the people of this country. We provide food, accommodation, and social services on a daily basis for people. So we know the present suffering of the people. And, and this is absolutely what was happening at the time. The Jamaat had indeed created and run this social service, this network for the nation's poor. And they created this commune style compound um, sort of on the outskirts of the, the city in Woodbrook in Port of Spain. Um, and that's where they built up a mosque, living quarters where members could live and they could worship. They built a school over time, a primary and secondary school, a medical clinic. There was a grocery. So this was sort of the compound um, over time increased in size. And they provided food, shelter and religion to this dispossessed urban population. Remember I said all of this was sort of happening in the later years, uh, in the later 80s. On the 27th of July, 1990, Abu Bakr and 113 other members of the Jamaat al-Muslimin attempted to, to overthrow the government. So they stormed the parliament and they held the then prime minister, um, a &R r Robinson and his cabinet, they held them hostage. They took control of, of the country's only television station. You know, during the, the attempted coup for, for the, the days that they held um, the, the country hostage, they, like I said, they held up parliament. Uh, millions was lost in, in um, looting and fire damage. 29 people were killed. Um, there was one point in which um, Abu Bakr and his followers, they, they instructed the prime minister um, to they held him at, gun, at gunpoint and they instructed him to direct the regiment to lay down their arms because you know to tell them when your government has fallen and instead you know prime minister um robinson he said into the walkie-talkie that they'd given him he said these people are murderers torturers and torturers attack with full force and as soon as he said that you know the, he was shot um you know him both him and and um the Minister of National Security, Selwyn Richardson at the time, they, they were shot. And um, in, in the Simmons uh, review, um, it says that he'd said at the time, you all have shot me, I'm going to die, but I'm prepared to die for my country. So it, it really was a time of, of great trial and, and tribulation, you know, those, those days um, where they, they held siege. On the 1st of August, though, they, they surrendered the army regained control and um, 
Abu Bakr and his 113 followers, they, they were immediately imprisoned. We're not going to go too much into all of the lengthy trials that happened, but, but we do need to, to, to note a few things. The first is that they were, all of them, released from prison just a few short years after the coup. Um, after the Court of Appeal in Trinidad held up an amnesty deal signed. So um, the acting president during the coup signed an amnesty saying that if you let everyone go, don't shoot anyone else, lay down your arms and come out, we will, we will let you all go. You, we won't try you, you'll be fine, you can go out. They signed this, this amnesty. Now the Privy Council overruled the Court of Appeal and they said actually the amnesty was invalid. Um, but they said, even though the amnesty was invalid, it would be an abusive process to try to subsequently try members of the Jamaat because they had surrendered in the belief induced by the government that they would not be prosecuted once they had surrendered. If anybody's interested in, in um, reading the Privy Council judgment, you can just send me an email and I'll uh, email it to you. But yeah, so they were all released. Um, and so Abu Bakr and his followers, they returned to their compound on Mokarapa Road in Western Nat, and, and they continued lived, living their lives. And in you know, what was quite a bold move, they actually sued the state for the damage caused to their buildings on their compound um, when the police had raided their compound during the, the attempted coup. So they sued. And they won that case, yeah, and they were actually awarded $2.1 million um, at the time in, in damages, um, which would be about 200,000 pounds. Over the years, you know, Abu Bakr was charged with a number of offenses, including murder, conspiracy to murder, possession of guns and ammunition, extortion, sedition. He was never convicted of, of any of these crimes and he actually passed away um, just over a year ago. In, in October 2021. And this is one of the flyers that was um, sort of distributed online and I imagine offline, but I was in Cardiff, so I don't really know how, how, how much it was promoted in Trinidad, but I certainly saw it offline, at online, um, where there, there were, was a at least one a concert held in his honor in his legacy um, a year after he passed away, so a couple of months ago, honoring the legacy of, of um, Abu Bakr. I just found, when I saw this online, I thought, oh, I have got to add it to my slides because it was just too interesting. Essentially, what we've seen is that the Jamaat al Muslim, the insurrectionists, they were arrested, later released. And they continued their social works in terms of assisting people within communities, but they also engaged in other works. They have been described by Professor Ryan as the biggest, baddest, most powerful, most controversial, most multifaceted gang in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, they attempted to, at least in theory, um, protect some of the communities in East Port of Spain from drugs and to stop um, people from selling drugs within these communities. But what was actually sort of happening on the ground was that they would stop people from selling drugs and they would take over um, some of these drug corners and they were very well armed in, in doing so. And so young people who came in and, and joined the, the Jamaat um, were given guns and um, ordered to go out onto the streets and to stop, um, you know, some of the illegal activities that that were happening. But they were also, you know, engaging in illegal activities whilst they were doing it. Um, the Jamaat has been openly um, connected to politicians. They have campaigned for political groups in almost every election since the since 1990 there has been an and and seen to be an interdependent relationship between the jamaat and um, certainly between abu bakr while he was alive and um the well the present prime minister and um you know abu bakr and and the jamaat provided political muscle within marginal uh, constituencies uh, during election time, pacifying warring gangs when they were getting out of hand within certain communities, and the Jamaat were given very lucrative um, 
grants to, to, to social programs, um, millions and millions of, of um, TNT dollars and millions of pounds that they were allowed to, to um, distribute. Um, according to the present prime, uh, well, the um, not the present prime minister, oof, former prime minister um, um, Patrick Manning, the the, the reason that um, his government uh, sought to engage with the Jamaat was in the hope to impose peace along within some of these communities. Um, because gangs were increasingly becoming a problem. So they intended to use the Jamaat as an enforcer. Um, and, and so they, they did this and many young men sort of remained with the Jamaat and, and engaged in this enforcement. Um, but many also broke away from the Jamaat and decided that they would form their own groups because they were empowered by um, what they saw the Jamaat doing. They took over the country and they were able to not just continue their lives, but also sue the state and be awarded millions of dollars and awarded subsequently millions of dollars in, in government contracts. So they were really seen as this really powerful group. And in many ways they were. And so the gangs became, the Jamaat certainly became quite entrenched. And then subsequently, this fractioning of gangs um, also created a, a lot more challenges um, within east-west port of Spain, within east port of Spain, and along the east-west uh, corridor within um, Trinidad and Tobago. So I do have some quotes here. I'm not going to sort of read all of them. If you are interested in, in having these slides, please get in touch with us um, and we can get them to you. Um, Certainly what, what um, Professor Ryan says in terms of the Jamatinist leaders having, he says that they seem to have constructed themselves as the vanguard of a new shanty state, which would function parallel to the mainstream state. And that's really sort of what we're coming on to now, that, that these gangs working and operating parallel to um, the, the mainstream state. And in, in my own work, I say that, you know, these corrupt police officers, politicians who were seen to and did actually openly consort with, with criminal leaders really created a lack of trust and, and respect, um, trust in and respect for the criminal justice system within, within Trinidad and Tobago. So I say in many communities, there is a void of state control and governance, and this has been replaced by the control and governance of gang members and gang leaders. What this also means is that the state has lost its monopoly on the use of force. And that's the point that I'd sort of got to within my PhD research, um, you know, sort of saying that, you know, as the gangs became more entrenched, as they became more powerful, you know, there are communities within Trinidad and Tobago um, where, you know, politicians they, they can't really go into unless unless gang leaders pave the way for for them um police officers won't go into some of the communities without a real um show of force so i sort of was very much of the view that you know that in a elijah and and verberian sense you know that really signified a loss of the monopoly on on the use of force which we're going to talk about a little bit now so not going to spend too, too long on it, but if we sort of go back to what uh, Weber says about, um, about what constitutes a state, what makes a state a state, he says that in large part that is about the use of, of physical force. Every state is founded on force. That is indeed right. And so I think this is likely one of the um, quotes that, well, anybody who sort of does a lot, does research on, on uh, states and, and legitimacy um, would, would know. He says, today, however, we have to say that a state is a human community that successfully claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. And so, you know, in my own view, sort of looking at what I was seeing happening 
with with the gangs in in uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, and that challenge that the state that the government has had in um, in operating um, to control um, what's happening within the gangs. You know, I'd say, well, then the state does not cannot claim cannot successfully claim a monopoly on the legitimate use of of physical force. Norbert Elias was was a student of um, of Weber. And um, in many ways, he sort of, um, he, he comes to the same conclusion. So Elias, in, in the civilizing process, it's sort of his main, the main purpose of Elias's work was to understand how, and to explain really how over, you know, about five centuries of development, Europeans came to view themselves as civilized while um, others, you know, um, were seen as barbaric or sort of languishing in a savage past. And it wasn't that Elias was saying that Europeans were more uh, civilized, you know, he, he didn't, he doesn't really say that, but trying to understand why Europeans sort of saw themselves in, in that way. And sorry, what, what he sort of comes down to is in, in many ways quite similar to, to what Weber says, that this you know, controlling taxes, controlling the finances, controlling the physical and military power and successfully doing that, successfully monopolizing physical and military power, that is what defines, that's what helps to, to define a, a state. I'm going to skip up, skip over this for one, and so this is essentially where where I got to, like I say, with my PhD research, and when I had originally planned this paper, that when we were looking at Trinidad and Tobago, we were looking at at a failed state, or at least one where the legitimacy legitimacy of the state couldn't really be recognized. You know, because if what you know what Weber is saying and what Elias is saying is that an essential part of this civilizing process is the state's monopoly or on, on the legitimate use of force, then what we are seeing in Trinidad and Tobago in this situation where the state has a limited monopoly or doesn't really have a monopoly on the use of force and gangs are competing for that monopoly of, of force and violence. And in fact, from the terminology that's used by those within these communities, you know, they describe the internecine conflict between gangs as war, and they refer to, you know, their friends and their gang members as soldiers, you know, that the, the factions within these communities really appear to see themselves as exercising a type of military power that's not within, within the purview of, of the state. So, like I said, that is sort of where I got to. And then I thought, all right, my, I don't really want to, to stop here with it. And I wanted to ask myself, and this is sort of something that I am still working through, so it's not completely uh, fully developed yet. But I did ask myself whether the state's monopoly of the use of force, whether this might be a Western state experience or an experience of states of, of the global North, because there are many non-Western states which have never been able to claim this monopoly on the legitimate use of force. And the state experience and characteristics in these, in these other countries and in the Caribbean may not necessarily reflect the Western experience, um, which Western criminology or criminology from the global north assumes and, and works with. Does that mean that that's where we need to stop? And I have this quote um, from um, Carrington and others, which I really, really like in, in the way that they talk about um, essentially how they talk about decolonizing knowledge. Um, I'm not of the school um, where, where I necessarily think that Southern theory is something that I want to engage with, but that's a conversation for another day. But I do like, like this quote, they say, we employ Southern theory in a reflexive way to elucidate the power relations of embedded 
the, the, the power relations embedded in the hierarchical production of criminological knowledge that privileges theories, assumptions, and methods based largely on empirical specificities of the global north. Yeah, and that's really what I want to challenge in, in looking at sort of defining what, what we mean by state. Do I need to? Am I trying to privilege assumptions and methods based largely on empirical specific specificities of the global north. You see, our purpose is not to dismiss, but to more usefully decolonize and democratize the toolbox of available criminological concepts, theories, and methods. And like I say, I'm not necessarily on board with, with, with Southern theory, um, uh, certainly because I, I don't necessarily view Australia as part of of the global south, um, but again, that's that's a conversation for another day. But it is something that I thought is really important um, to 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 grapple with. And so, one of the things that that I so I started looking for literature about um, state and state legitimacy that was sort of outside of Elias and Weber, and um, Wolf Moore in twenty eleven sort of says that that there is this growing consensus within academia, within policy circles, that what we see, what, what, what people are talking about in terms of peace and state building, et cetera, they haven't actually, they don't work well to talk about the development um, in, in, of states in, in, in Africa and more broadly in, in the global South. So I thought, yeah, absolutely. This, this is something that, that's making a lot of sense to me. And Mega sort of, of, of said the same same thing and said, right, well, what we should actually be looking at and what might actually be more useful is thinking through this concept of, of hybrid governance. Yeah, so Mega says, she says, the term hybrid governance will be used here as a general term to cover the range of contemporary perspectives, arguing that in fragile regions, states operate alongside informal and other non-state forms of organization in the exercise of public authority and service provision. So you do have that state, you do have the fact the state is working, but the state is working alongside other non-state forms of, of organization. And this is something that is seen sort of um, in, it's not a strange thing to see. It happens in many, many states that are outside of, of the global north. And again, so looking at, and this isn't, it's far from, from an exhaustive list, um, but a, some of, of the, um, the, the literature that, that I'd been looking at. So Ray was looking at divided sovereignty in Ghana, you know, and looking at the fact that traditional chiefs or traditional authorities or chiefs work alongside state um, state actors in, in sort of making decisions and, and all of these things. And I thought mm, maybe we can distinguish Ghana from, from, from states like Trinidad and Tobago because it is embedded within their, their constitution in, in Ghana that there is the National House of Chiefs. So I thought similar, but not, not quite the same. If they do have that sort of embedded within, within their constitution that there is this hybridity. But 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 Somaliland, um, not recognized certainly not not recognized by by the UN by many other countries as a state. Um, lots of 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 conflict um, existing existing there. Um, and what Mo says, you know that that legitimate state monopoly of violence in talking about what's happening in Somaliland is the exception rather than the norm. You know on the African continent and within the global south. Um, more more broadly, Cruz talking about um, what was happening in, in, in Central America. Cruz says, you know, the police's legitimacy does not rest on its monopoly of the force, of the use of force, but on its ability to generate social order along with other actors. So we're seeing it again happening in, in, in other countries within, within the, the, the global south where you have the state, but also non-state actors who sort of work alongside the state. And this isn't seen as something that de-legitimizes um, uh, the existence of, of, a, of a strong state. Uh, Mega, and I think of the ones that I've read thus far, I think her article was the one that I found um, most interesting. And, you know, she says, 
we must distinguish between constructive and corrosive forms of non-state order. And I think that's sort of the point um, that I'm at right now in terms of looking at the, the gangs within um, Trinan and Tobago, working, um, there, there, there are many good things that they do in terms of providing education um, uh, or the capacity uh, for education, like buying people's book lists and uniforms and, and that sort of thing, um, you know, ensuring that people have access to, to health care. There's a lot of things, um, social and financial, that these gang leaders do within their communities that the state is not actually providing for within the people who live within these communities. The challenge is that they're also e extremely involved in, in um, drugs and um, their activity is likely what drives up the, the already high murder rate within, within the country. So, so we're almost there. I think what, what is likely the, the most similar um, state um, that is useful is it, to, to compare to Trinidad is Jamaica because they sort of operate in a very similar way where the, the dons in, in Jamaica, they assist in terms of the, the governance of particular um, communities, punishment of people in particular communities, but assisting with the social and educational and the welfare needs of people within these communities and also involved heavily in, in, um, in criminal activities. And Jaffa um, sort of describes this as, as a hybrid state to refer to that entanglement between, between the two groups. And I do sort of refer to, I use Fanon, um, I, and I do, do refer to Fanon in, 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 in my um, PhD research, but I think that what, what I find useful in using this, um, in sort of talking about the state and in talking about that hybrid state in a Caribbean context that is, I think, a bit different from the, the African context is that there isn't sort of that within the Caribbean, that long history of, of the traditional chiefs and all of that. We, we, we don't have that in the Caribbean. What we do have is that conflict between the colonial power and the people or what now exists as the state and the poor of, of, of the country. And that's sort of what Fanon is talking about here, you know, that, that you do have that, 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 that first the colonial um, empire um, and, and, and yeah, so the, the police, Fanon says, was an extension of the slave owner, and later of the colonizer and, and, now what we're seeing is, is that they're seen very much the same way as oppressors within um, the communities, poor communities, particularly in East um, Port of Spain in, in Trinidad. And that's really what I've come down to now. So essentially two questions that I'm asking and I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. You know, is that um, Weberian, Elijah approach useful in assessing, you know, the state in Trinidad and Tobago? Or is that hybrid state, that idea of a hybrid state, a more useful uh, theoretical lens through which we can assess the state? Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you so much. Um, There's so much in there. That was a really rich presentation. And I really appreciated the very detailed history of the, the rise of the of the jam, the Jamaat al-Muslimin. I think that was really important historical context. Um, I'm just going to invite anyone in the audience to raise their hands and I'll get to you um, in a second. Um, failing that, if you'd rather post your question in the chat, that's cool too. I have one question I just wanted to kind of start off with. Um, and I'm I'm really struck by the fact that, you know, after the coup, I work in Puerto Rico. And so my kind of... Um, the things that I'm accustomed to when there are objections to state power are generally crushed very, very violently. Um, obviously, this is part of it being a colony of the US, but I think also of the Granada Revolution and how powerfully smothered that was. In this case, they not only, you know, they they they, they not only weren't convicted or weren't murdered and didn't die in jail, but seemed to get reparations. And I was wondering um whether you could elaborate on 
some of the kind of political context in which that becomes possible and whether that is reflects a kind of um, a disinterest from its former colonial powers. You know, in the case of Puerto Rico and Granada, there was very active interference from other places. So it's just in kind of elaborating the the kind of surprising way of how did these guys get away with this in, in this setting, what's unique to the Trinidad and Tobago context. Um, and the, the other question, I realize that's quite a long one, which I'll come back to, is I was wondering if um, you could comment on the kind of organization of race and power in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so, I, you know, you mentioned it's a multiracial, multiethnic society. Um, and I was wondering whether um, in, you know, your um, your experience, your, your your perspective, whether it's governing class or representative of its population, um, because I guess the organization that, you know, that, that you mentioned, um, they seem very much to me like a black organization. And I wonder if, um, if the government of Trinidad and Tobago represent the people of it or whether they're racially whiter, um, lighter, more European, as we find in lots of other Caribbean contexts. So I'm going to stop there because they're two quite meaty questions. And if, if we forget one of them, that's fine. Um, but I'll let you go. I'll start with the second one because it's fresh in my mind now. Um, and uh, Trinidad and Tobago, I don't have the exact details from the census in front of me, but essentially it is, um, let's say, just over 40% Indo-Trinadian because of uh, East Indian indentured laborers who were brought to work on the plantations um, after slavery. And then just a little bit less than that is its Black population. And then it's sort of mixed then with, um, there's a sort of a large population of mixed Indo and Afro-Trinadians that we call Dogla. Um, and then we've got Chinese, Syrian Lebanese, just um, loads of, you know, people from all over the world otherwise. Um, the, the political landscape um, as it exists presently, as it has existed, certainly for most of my lifetime, um, and I, I sort of would argue um, sort of since post uh, independence has been sort of dominated by two main political parties. One that um, is made up of and supported mostly by Indo-Trinadians and one that is made up of and supported mostly by Afro-Trinadians. Obviously this isn't as black and white as it sounds, but broadly that, that is kind of what, what it looks like. So I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily say that the um, the government doesn't look like the population. I think that depending on which of the two was in power at the time, it looks like half of the population. Um, I, I would say that um, there certainly are are challenges with respect to race and ethnicity and politics. Um, but it's not something that I can really go into in great detail today. Um, does that answer that question? Yes, it does. It does partially and makes me think of lots of other ones too, but perhaps I'll get to them a little later on and see what others have, have to say. Um, and, and, and I guess, yeah, the other question um, was about um, the context in which a coup is forgiven you know, in a Caribbean context when so many other agitations against state power are forcefully crushed. I think of the independence movement in Puerto Rico. I think of the what happens in Granada, you know, really, really violently squashed. Is that to do with not just a failure to monopolize state power, but an actual lack of power on the part of the state? Or is it to do with some other kind of assessment of the best way of navigating out of choppy waters. Um, again, th you may, perhaps um, that's not really easily summed up in one answer. These are just some of the questions I'm thinking about. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And it's it's uh, something that I'm grappling with myself and have been for, for some time, certainly with respect to this paper. Um, I don't know that there has been, that there has been uh, forgiveness. I, I wouldn't say that they, that anybody was, was forgiven for, for the coup. Um, what, what I would say is that legally, and um, you know, that is part of my background, legally they were um, they were freed based on this um, amnesty um, that was first not upheld and then upheld and then 
So, but in terms of societally, I think the, the challenge is that they, and that's, I suppose, why it is a little bit difficult to, to, to explain it, that there are very many people who were and have always been sort of very against and will always stand against what the Jamaat al muslimin has done. But the, the Jamaat al muslimin has also done um, a lot for a lot of people in, you know, from within particular communities. And these are communities who that have felt um, as though they have not been supported by successive governments, that they've been forgotten by the state, um, the, the state in power, but also by the rest of the country, that people think of them in a particular way. And they only see, well, this is a group that has empowered them, that has assisted them and continues to do so. Um, and so they are more likely to look at them more favorably than, than they otherwise would have. Um, but I, I don't think that it's as straightforward as that they that they were forgiven. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I'm just noticing some comments and questions in the in the comment box. One from N. R. Moore, I think, who said that a, that the current government in service in the, in the makeup of the cabinet appears to be broadly representative of the various racial groups. Um, that that seems to me quite striking coming from. Um, someone who's perhaps more familiar with the Latin American post colonies, um, where there, I would not say that was the case, um, but feel free to challenge me. Um, another question that was from Raymond Ramcharita, sorry if I mispronounced that, um, who seemed to um, want to talk more about the analogy between Jamaica and Trinidad. So maybe before pointing that to M Melissa, um, Raymond, would you like to say a little bit more about um, what your query was with regards to that? Okay, hi, Raymond Ramcha. Um, I won't turn on my uh my camera because okay. the um my bandwidth is low. Okay, hi Melissa. I quite enjoyed your, your presentation. Um okay, the, the issue is the how did these attitudes, the kind of anarchy that pervades Trinidad and Tobago that eventually resulted in this coup and the, the attitudes continue today. So to steal a phrase from Naipaul, it's like a million revolutions happening every minute. Um, you, you said it was comparable to Jamaica, but Jamaica has a very different history and trajectory. Um, I don't know if you saw Ramesh Devsaran's book on the coup, mm -hmm. A Study in Legal Mysticism. That, I mean, so the your, your thing, I was surprised at the, thing, at the title of your talk, Civilization and Decivilizing, because that can ruffle a lot of feathers in the kind of neo-nativism, neo-nationalism, right? But um, the idea, because these two large competing groups have always been at war, I mean, Trinidad's history started very late in 1802 with the Treaty of Amiens. And it started to be populated really in, in the middle of the 19th century. So it has a relatively short history. And the, um, the conflict between the Afro and Indo groups has always dominated the politics. Um, so because of that contention, you have had um, problems with education, what constitutes the national character and so on and so on. And in that, so there's never really been a common stock of values. So I don't want to talk too much. It's Melissa's presentation, but that's the kind of discussion that I was really hoping for. Maybe we could continue into that. The values, how those values got seated, what they are and enumeration of them that led to this rather than the, uh, the mechanics which are necessary of the Jamaat coup. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Raymond. And yeah, go ahead. I think, I think that I think that I agree with, with um, a lot of what you've said. Certainly, um, I didn't mean to suggest that Trinidad and Jamaica were the same, um, only that there was similarity between um, 
between what's happening with the dons in, in Jamaica and the way that they take care of their communities and what we see with community leaders in Trinidad or what we see happening sort of more, a lot more recently. What happens with dons in Jamaica has been happening for a much longer time than what we see with these community leaders in Trinidad. But there are certainly similarities that we can talk about there and in, in acknowledging these similarities, then I would seek to draw from um, what is quite uh, a, a large and useful body of literature that sort of analyzes that phenomenon in terms of, of the hybrid state. But one of the things that I definitely stayed away from in, in this um, presentation and um, strangely enough, didn't have to just go into too much in, in the PhD, was that issue of the, the difficulties that exist between, um, between the Indo-Trinidad population and the Afro-Trinidad population. Certainly with respect to this particular topic or this particular talk, it's not something that I saw as particularly relevant um, in looking at civilizing processes or de-civilizing processes. Is it relevant in terms more broadly of the history of Trinidad and Tobago and its politics? Absolutely. Um, but essentially in talking about how we wish to analyze what makes a state and whether Trinidad and Tobago can be described as a failed state because of the lack of the monopoly of, of the use of power, whether we choose to look at it through the lens of Weber and Elias or some other lens, that's not something um, that I still don't, don't think that, that it's something that um, required a discussion of the um, challenges with respect to um, the different ethnicities um, and, and the political makeup. I definitely do agree with you though, in terms of how has this come to be what it is in terms of what we see in East Port of Spain, what we see happening with the Jamat, um, what we see in some of the communities within, within East Port of Spain. I think that that is extremely uh, important um, sort of to, to most things that, that we talk about. And it's actually um, in, in large part what my PhD research was about. Um, and um, you know, a lot of my findings in talking to um, some of the young men who come from these communities, when they talk about the fact that they don't think that people in Trinidad care about them, the government doesn't care about them, Trinidad doesn't care about them, so they don't care about Trinidad, you know, they, they don't care about people who don't care about them. And, you know, they talk about the codes that they live by and the codes that they live by within their communities, the codes that they live by within, within their gangs, you know, th those are definitely things um, that are sort of quite relevant to how the Jamaat um, came to be as empowered as it was and how um, the, the gangs became as embedded and, as they are and, and why they seem to be as entrenched as they are and, and difficult to, to get rid of. Thank you. Um, we've got a few more questions in the chat. Um, and before I jump, I've got about half an hour left as well. Um, so lots of questions keep going with. One thing I just wanted to um, raise was, um, you know, I think one of your big questions is, you know, how useful is Weber for Trinidad and Tobago? And as a, you know, somebody who thinks about prisons in the carceral state in Latin America, pretty much all of the theory coming out of the North just doesn't apply and actually isn't that helpful. Um, and, you know, things that like, the, the, the recognition of the considerable amount of authority that, you know, incarcerated people, prisoners hold in, in Latin American prison regimes really upend the idea of a kind of, you know, a state crushing as a crushing force with the legitimate monopoly. Um, and I think that, you know, your research is smack in a very, very lively debate about the blurring of state power and the underworld in the post colonies and I think very much of the kind of southern criminologists such as Maximo Sozo and others and you mentioned I, I got the sense that you weren't too convinced about the idea of southern criminology and I wondered if um, perhaps if we have different understandings of like what what southern theory means or if you could elaborate a bit on what that resistance is because it seems to me so obvious that a theory developed you know in 
in, in France or in Europe, plonked on Trinidad and Tobago is going to fall apart. So yes, we need more stuff. So so what is your particular qualm with Southern Southern theory? I, I don't have a, I don't have trouble with Southern theory um, in terms of some of the sort of Southern theorists. I think my difficulty is with some of the Southern theorists who discuss Australia as though, because a lot of this has come out of Australia and they discuss what's happening in Australia as though it is a, it's not part of the global North um, and not. So there are certainly people like Sozo, like Tuari who recognize um, and who are from and have connections to indigenous backgrounds and look at certainly Southern criminology from that standpoint. And I find that really useful. And I have actually referred to a lot of their work in, I've got a decolonization module, um, decolonizing criminology. And I think it's really useful um, for that. But I think that there is a lot that's sort of coming out of, of Australia that's touted to be Southern theory that is still very much not decolonized, I think is the nicest way I can put it. So that. it doesn't go far enough as far as you're concerned. Or it's not coming necessarily from the right place or the right people. Uh -huh. And it's not it's not nuanced not enough. Southern. <laughs> oh yeah, and that, yeah. Um interesting perspective. Thank you. Um I'm gonna jump in with a question from I believe Wybing Me. Sorry if that was mispronounced. Um, they say, thank you for your thought provoking speech. Um, could you explain a bit more the relationship between the Jamaat community and other communities? You said they are Muslims, mostly consisting of Afro Trinidadians. What is this community's attitude or relationship with other religions, ethnicities, such as Indian Trinidadians, Chinese Trinidadians, or their conflict, contestation, collaboration? Um, you know, how important is Islam here? Um, yeah, if you could just, that's the, yeah. I don't think that there was that there is certainly not now, and I don't think that there has been a lot of conflict between the Jamaat al Muslimin and other um, religious groups. Um, it just so happened, I think. It's not that they were in conflict with any other religious groups. It really has been certainly with respect to the coup and and more um, subsequently. It it hasn't been about religion that's more of a vehicle for 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 what they've done they happen to be um they happen to be muslim um but their fight has always been or you know certainly historically was has been for um it, it's about class and status group and about um fighting for what they see as uh, the rights of um depressed communities so one of the things that at the time in 1990 that Abu Bakr said um, prompted that the the that, that final straw for them was when they the government erected um, a statue and oh, can't remember who it was of at the moment but they spent a lot of money erecting a, a statue of someone and uh, Abu Bakr said in his, his speech when when he'd taken over in his very first speech that that it had been the last straw because um you know that people were living in poverty that they had introduced all these new taxes withdrawn welfare that you know imposed austerity measures and yet they could see it fit to spend all this money on this statue and they they saw that as 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 really really tr troubling, and um, the last straw for for that particular group. And I of course I'm not saying that, you know, that they were all good and and they only ever wanted good for everyone in the country and all of these things. But certainly a lot of what they said was about um, empowering people from poorer communities in and, and bringing um ensuring that there was a more just society for people who who lived in in Trinidad and Tobago um like I said they the Jamaat um and and Abu Bakr a lot of what came out of of um his his thinking his learning his teaching was from the the black power movement in in the 60s and the 70s um but I don't know I wouldn't say that they excluded people from other ethnicities and they certainly 
didn't um, haven't as far as I understand it had any challenges with with people from from other ethnicities either. Jean Miles, that's it. Thank you, Raymond. Yeah, yeah. Raymond is putting in a lot of useful stuff in here. Um, just that the statue was of a person called Jean Miles, Trinidad's first whistleblower, who had her life ruined for her trouble. She was a Trinidadian of European descent. Um, and incidentally, one of the central parts of the Trinidad Carnival is the reenactment of a riot, the 1881 Canboulet riot, which is touted as intrinsic to authentic Trinidad. Thank you, Raymond. Um, I'm sure you're full of other interesting pieces. Um, one of the questions had to do with um, what your kind of particular take on these terms civilizing and un uncivilizing are. They seem quite loaded terms in 2022. Um, I think you did talk in the beginning about uh, your use of them, but perhaps you could clarify that for, for the audience. Um, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I think they are absolutely loaded. And, um, and I think that that's part of the reason, well, part of the reason that, that I use them. Um, certainly for the, the title of, of, the, um, of the paper. But it's also a large part of the reason why, why I want to challenge them because they are so loaded. And because it is, you know, it is so problematic and so challenging and, and quite frankly, so wrong to, um, to label all countries that come, that are not of, Western Europe and, and North America, so people country and, and, and Australia that are not from, from the global north um, as, as uncivilized and to, to talk about these places um, as though, and, and to, to say that their, their governments, that there are decivilizing processes in the way that their states yes. operate. Yeah, I, I certainly don't agree that um, Trinidad and Tobago or, or you know, countries of, of the global south are, are uncivilized or, or decivilized. Um, I use these terms um, so, so that we can challenge them, um, but they are the terms that have been used by, um, by theorists like Weber, like Elias, and they are, they are terms and, and, uh, that are used by the, uh, theorists today as well. Um, so yeah, we do have to engage with them. We're not going to pretend they don't exist, but we can challenge them and, and talk about um, what's, what's not, not useful about them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, and I think that, you know, going back to the utility of these frameworks, things like, you know, the state is having a monopoly on violence, you know, is that true? No, it's not. Um, uh, you know, ideas about, um, like, the whole discourse is around failed states. And the reason that they're such, I, I think, very, very useless and distracting discourses, I think one way to criticize this kind of work is to think about how, that dichotomy of, you know, law and lawlessness or, you know, law and order and criminality is not as probably as clear cut, you know, even within the former European powers or global north context as we like to think of it. it and, you know, I think of extrajudicial killings um, in, in Great Britain and in the United States. Um, and, and I wonder if, you know, perhaps one way to explore this is to put this, you know, back into a conversation of, Trinidad and Tobago, you know, with its former co colonial powers, I, I wonder if that would be like an avenue to explore there. It seems kind of obviously relevant, but we didn't get to hear so much about it today. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, I, one other question I had regarded um, one of your early slides, you had a quote from, I think somebody, I, I don't know if I noted it correctly, it was called Ryan and it was a 2013 kind of characterization of, a, of an underclass. Mm. And, in there, it seemed to me there was a lot of language, you know, things about single dysfunctional mothers. families mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, underclass and a lot of these um, very, very weighty judgmental terms that took me right back to Oscar Lewis and culture of poverty stuff and conversations in the 60s. Um, I wonder, you know, what is your um, your reaction to this kind of characterization of whole parts of, of, of cities, you know, what's, what's, what's your take on that? Well, there are two things that I want to say. The first is that um, Professor Ryan has done exceptional work um, in, in Trinidad and Tobago uh, on, in criminology um, and sort of broadly within the Caribbean. His work is 
is excellent, but we have to to remember that you know he was writing at a time, and he obviously he continues to write. But, but some of these things and some some of the things that he, the language that he uses and stuff, it's not it's not stuff that we would we would necessarily use now. Like within there's one of the chapters that that I write about in in my own work that's about the family life of the young boys that that I interviewed, and you know a lot of them. The vast majority of them talk about coming from um, homes where um, where it was a single parent home, where we you know it was you know they were raised by their mothers or they were raised by their grandmothers and their aunts or whatever. And I don't talk about it, and I make a, a really an important point not to talk about it as though you know this is something that is dysfunctional or that there is a deficit there. You know, I talk about it in terms of the fact that particularly within, um, yes, Salvin Ryan, um, particularly within um, a Caribbean and a Trinbagonian um, context, you know, there is a matrifocal society that, that you know, mothers are, uh, that the women are, are strong and that women are, oh no, um, I didn't know that, Raymond. That <laughs> um, that women are uh, leaders within 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 the communities, and um, and that they do a lot in in, in supporting uh, their families and their communities. Um, oh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought there. Um, the, the point that that I'm making is that I don't view. Um, this as as a deficit within within um, communities or within families, but I have to say that the young men that I interviewed they saw it as a deficit within their own lives, and I think that that's something that's really really important. And one of the things that I talk about in terms of changing narratives and stigma within um, families and communities is about teaching about different types of families from, from, from primary school level right up so that you understand that, that there is this difference because these young men definitely saw it as a deficit in their lives that they, they didn't grow up with, um, with a father figure in, in their households. Yeah, sorry. Interesting, um, thanks so much. Um, I think we have a hand up from Peter Frazier. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, I have a few comments, really. One is um, Selvin Ryan. He was my colleague in Trinidad and Tobago in March this year, and he originally was a political scientist. And I don't think he ever would have claimed to be a criminologist, um, but he began doing public opinion surveys and then did various other surveys. The fact that he was more than slightly old fashioned is something I can attest to. Um, the point that the that you uh, share made, I think, is that the ruling classes in the Commonwealth Caribbean can look exactly like the people that they govern rather than being light or whatever. But actually, they don't think of themselves as part of that, because what I've called the half liberal political tradition in the Commonwealth Caribbean, half liberal because we didn't have, on the whole, the property, but we acquired the education. And of course, in the liberal tradition, it was the property and the educated who should govern, not the old ruling classes. And what that has led to as a ruling class, I think it's fairly common throughout the Caribbean, and even in revolutionary Grenada, you can see that, where in fact the people who don't have the same level of education as the ruling classes are not really listened to and not really taken seriously. And I think that is one of the reasons why Jamaat Islam could be that important, because in fact it did take people seriously. A parallel is actually with India, where the old Congress party, mostly Brahmins, etc., who believed in a politics, not democratic politics, but one where they were destined to rule, were replaced by a party whom we might abhor, or political movements, 
who actually paid attention to the needs of people and did the same sort of welfare things, etc. Not uncommon in a lot of countries where that's what drug gangs do, for instance, and drug lords. And the last thing I would mention is that one of the problems, of course, is, and we don't like these terms either about young countries and old countries or middle-aged countries, but one of the best books about the violence and disorganization of the early years of independence is one by Seymour Martin Lipset called The First New Nation, which was about the United States of America and precisely the amount of violence that took place, I'm not talking about slavery now, but political violence, which of course led eventually to the Civil War. So I think that also has to be taken account. States take some time mm -hmm. to acquire a monopoly of violence. Thanks, Peter. Leave it at that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Melissa, I'd, I have a few thoughts on that, but I don't know if you want to respond. Well, I just have to say that I agree with everything that Peter just said. Certainly, when Elias was talking about, um, you know, European states, he was talking about hundreds of years over which this civilizing process happened. He wasn't talking about something that happened over a short period of time. So certainly that last point on, you know, it takes some time um, to acquire this um, monopoly on the legit legitimate use of force, that... Um, I think that that's a valid observation. And in terms of the ruling population looking like the, um, the rest of the population, but not necessarily seeing themselves as part of the population, it's something that I, I do write about in, in um, my PhD, not necessarily in terms of, the, the, of, of politicians, but in terms of the police, as it is something that... Um, I remember my supervisors asking me about, you know, what do the, the police look like? Do they come from the same class and, and racial groups as, as the people that they police? And yeah, absolutely. Whilst they come from the same, they may come from the same um, backgrounds, many of them and, and ethnic groups, even um, in terms of their education, many of them are not a lot uh, better educated than the people that that they police they certainly don't see themselves as belonging to the same status groups as as the people that they police and that makes for a, a very challenging interaction between between the groups yeah absolutely and, and you know and i do wonder whether um there's room in your work to trouble this idea of legitimate violence, legitimate use of violence. Um, I put in the chat there a book, The Law is a White Dog. And I think that one of the things that this text does, um, as well as taking you on a kind of whirlwind of court cases involving ghosts and Guantanamo Bay and detaining kids on the border between the US and Mexico, it's kind of really troubled the idea of what legitimacy is. Um, and I, my, my, my suspicion is, um, that, you know, thickening up our sense of, uh, European states follow this trajectory and the post colonies are on this other one that it's, you know, usually turns out to be, you know, f far more muddled than, than we think at the beginning. And that's definitely a direction I would encourage you, um, to think through. Um, I wonder if, you know, we have about 10 minutes, um, 10 minutes left. So, if anyone else has some questions they want to put in the chat, do go ahead. Um, I think um, just in terms of, uh, oh, hang on, we have one here. Uh, that's No, that's just, just a reading suggestion. Um, yeah, I guess um, if we want to think about, do you want to have any kind of final words on, you know, what, what legitimate use of force is? I think we have a question. One more. I think we have a question. Oh, thank you. <laughs> much better moderated than me. Um, yeah, go ahead. I just want to quickly ask you about um, how you perceive or how you think of the, you know, how, how the community, the local community perceive this kind of uh, non-state authority, political or non-state uh, political power. Do they, because you said that the, the place, the place of the state become a new colonial power, like something like that become a new, oppressor. So 
some some group like that the the uh, yeah they match the German Muslim group whether they are like a like a like a power contesting the you know, the, the police from the state or they are they are also kind of oppressor. I don't know. I don't know. Just I just want to inquire <laughs> inquire you about the communities people's opinion about them. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's a good question. I think that there are a lot of of challenges um, with people's um, trust and confidence in in the police in in Trinidad and Tobago. There have been a number of, um, you know, there's been a lot of research, some surveys that have been done. And um, generally, people tend to believe that um, the police uh, service is more corrupt than it needs to be um, within Trinidad and Tobago. So there are, you know, difficulties with, with, um, with corruption and people's trust and confidence in, in the police. Um, I don't necessarily know that I would say that the, the public um, broadly view the police as a neo-colonial power i think in the in the sense in the sense of what i was saying earlier was that people within particular communities for example those in in east port of spain are more likely to view the police in in that way i don't know that i can say that the broader population see the police in that light i i i don't know but i think that you're absolutely right um that you know these other groups these groups that operate sort of parallel to the state that they are also quite an oppressive power um, within within the country in terms of holding the country to ransom because of extreme rates of of, um, violence that they perpetuate within the country. Yeah, I I think so, absolutely. Yeah, so why the, uh, sorry, why the the people also can um, like perceive the damaged community as like an agency or which can stage some of their rights to the state, to the police, like in contestation to the state. So, sorry, so, I'm not sure I understand. I mean, I mean, why the uh, so that's why the the like the people, the pub, the people uh, can say the Jamaican community as a kind of some representative of some of their right can can like. Uh, as a counter power to the state and to like yes like to at least to express some of the uh, the needs of the like the appeal of the rights of the some poor people absolutely because the the jamaat al muslimin uh, alongside other you know criminal groups they provide for people within these communities in a way that the state doesn't provide for them um at the time you know when People have to, to buy books for their kids um, and the, at the start of the school year. They will go line up outside the gang leaders or the community leaders' houses and they will, you know, bring them their book lists and they pay for uniforms and they pay for people to, to go to the hospitals and to see doctors. So within these communities, you know, the community leaders or the gang leaders are doing a lot more for them in their eyes or certainly tangible um, results they're seeing from from these community leaders, and they don't see that from from the broader state. So, so in that way, absolutely, they are going to, you know, put some more trust in in these leaders. But it isn't even just about that. There is also that element of fear, and and they fear these people more than they they fear the police in in, in many cases. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for these questions. They've all been really, really productive and generative. And um, we're probably about to head out of time now. So I just wanted to thank you, Melissa, for um, not just your presentation, but for, um, yeah, having the patience of all these questions. Um, I'm sure people can email you if they have uh, anything else to wrap up with. Um, And yeah, just, just a big thank you.